I'm Andreas Blum, parish priest to the German-speaking Catholic parish of St. Boniface in London. And I'm Barbara Höfling, singer and director of the German Choir of London. Welcome to our podcast on theology and music. Christianity begins with the story of the Passion, with horror and grief at the violent death of a human being. But many people cross Jesus' path of suffering, whether indifferent, reluctant, powerless, compassionate, faithful or supportive. In words and music, we want to try to put ourselves in the place of these people and look at where they touch our own lives, these minor figures in the biblical passion story. Simon Peter, also called Cephas, that is the rock, is probably one of the best known of Jesus' apostles in the Bible. No other man is mentioned more often in the Gospels. None other has such a prominent position, and we know more about him than about any other disciple. His name still resonates today, for all popes are given the title Saint Peter's successor. But anyone who concludes that this man must have been a shining example, a forceful personality, or even an unbeaten hero, is quite mistaken. And the Gospels make no secret of it. He must have been an enthusiast, certainly a passionate man, who wanted to do things right and to do them well, who zealously set his sights on the highest goals, who threw himself heart and soul into the fray, which makes his frequent failures all the more shameful. And after watching this Peter in action, we have to ask ourselves more than once, what in heaven's name was Jesus thinking when he named this unstable figure of all people as the rock on which he wanted to build his church? Let's start at the beginning. Peter and his brother Andrew are the first disciples mentioned by name. Jesus calls out to them at the Sea of Galilee and invites them to go with him. In the end, Peter is also the first to enter the empty tomb. Others had run there faster, but they waited and deliberately let him go in first. He must somehow have gained authority among the disciples. But how? I can't think of any stories that show him in an impressive light. On the contrary, one moment he refuses to let Jesus wash his feet, and then suddenly he wants to be washed from head to toe, making it clear that he hasn't understood a thing. Or when he takes Jesus aside, and in all seriousness, wants to advise him that this cross-business 
he keeps talking about isn't a good strategy and won't get him anywhere. Jesus turns on him, even calling him Satan, an adversary, opponent of God. And Peter really hits rock bottom on the Sea of Galilee, quite literally. Full of bravado, he wanted to copy Jesus and walk on the lake. And for a few steps it goes well. But then he sees the waves and the storm, and fear takes over, and Peter sinks into the water. And it's this fear, all too understandable from a human point of view, that leads to the saddest and most humbling incident in his life, in the courtyard of the high priest's palace, as the passion unfolds. Jesus had predicted it, but Peter had dismissed his words out of hand. And now it's happened after all. Peter denies any knowledge of Jesus. Not once, not twice, he denies him three times. And the fact that his courage fails him before a woman, a maid, completes his humiliation. Of course he is afraid for his life. He fears that he too will fall victim to the mob and to the power of the state arrested by the Romans or lynched in the street. And in the end, Peter even swears, I do not know the man. When the cock crows, he remembers Jesus' prediction, and he becomes painfully aware of his cowardice, his betrayal, and, as the Gospel says, he wept bitterly. So Peter was anything but a hero, more quicksand than a rock. 
when Jesus needed to count on him, when his support and help really mattered, all his earlier pledges turned out to be hollow. Jesus replied on him, but at the crucial moment the friendship wasn't strong enough. I remember a bishop in Cologne who, not least for this reason, felt constrained to say that he was ashamed of Peter. Is Peter the apostle to be ashamed of? Is that right? Is that who he is? I must admit that I actually feel a lot of sympathy for Peter. He reminds me of the plans, the resolutions, the passions of mine that I embark on with the best intentions, but which somehow get stuck halfway and are eventually laid quietly to rest. Then I end up walking past this man who was always sitting at the exit from the underground. I don't know him. Then I can't really identify with the natural disasters in far-off lands. They are too far away. I don't know them. Or, on the other hand, the war in Ukraine, with all its victims, gets too much for me, and I say, I really don't want to know all of this. My faith tells me otherwise. My conscience too, in fact. I don't like to admit it. It feels too much like failure. But whenever I ask myself if it's even worth trying again, or if I should just let things go and spare myself the embarrassment, that's when I think of Peter. He didn't give up. He tried again and again. And that was enough for Jesus. And the disciples could even see leadership in that. For me, Peter is both a warning and an encouragement. A warning not to bite off more than I can chew and to remain realistic. And an encouragement not to plead my weakness as an excuse for giving up. At the very end, after Jesus' death and resurrection, he and Peter meet again where their story started, at the Sea of Galilee. Peter had denied Jesus three times, and now he is asked three times by him, Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It is not success that matters, but love. In the end, this is the only thing that counts in Jesus' eyes. And this is the strength that stops us giving up in the face of the troubles of this world.